So today's topic is my recent trip to China and meeting Esperanto speakers while I was there. So this all happened a couple of months ago during the time when I was not active on YouTube. Uh, and what the original plan of the trip was, I say original plan because plans never go according to plan, uh, was to spend a month in China, several weeks with family members, and then several weeks traveling. But what actually happened is the wife went a week ahead of me due to family reasons. And by the time I arrived, she started coming down with the symptoms of COVID, which meant I had to look after her and naturally I got COVID and then she had to look after me. And funnily enough, this was the first time either of us had ever gotten COVID. And thank God it was basically like a mild flu for us and so nothing really to worry about. So after that, uh, we spent some time with family members and then finally we started our travel. So naturally I was like, I wonder if there's any Esperanto speakers. And in the city where she lives, uh, Weifang, which is not like a major international city in any sense, there was a couple that I found on WeChat, but I didn't have the opportunity to meet up with them just due to schedules not aligning. Uh, after that, we went, uh, we started traveling along basically the coastline of China heading downwards. And her city, to give you an idea, actually, rather than giving you an idea, I'll just open up um, maps and show you guys. Okay, so, so her city is, uh, I've zoomed in too far. It's too hard to see. It's in here somewhere. Anyway, uh, we were in this region and then we traveled down along this region and then around here. So basically I ended up reaching out to some Esperanto speakers in a WeChat group. And you need to remember uh, the Chinese Esperanto speaking community, it doesn't have access to Western social media. So it's actually quite distinct in a lot of ways from the, like I'm gonna say the, the Western Esperanto speaking community because they don't see the same stuff that we see every day type of thing in the Esperanto community. They don't have access to like Reddit and Facebook and YouTube and pretty much anything you could imagine except for their own internal systems. So I reached out via WeChat and I came in contact with a um, Esperantist there who actually worked at one of the universities in a city that's called, I don't have the Chinese name here because we were speaking in Esperanto, but it's uh, called Zhao Zhuang. Um, Here's our little chat. As you can see, we were just chatting in Esperanto here and we've got some like discussions happening. Anyway, I just want to make sure I didn't show you guys anything private there. No, nothing major. Anyway, so I reached out to him and I said, hey, you know, like um, I'm going to be passing through your city. Uh, will there be a chance to meet up? And he was like super excited. And he said, yeah, we've got Esperanto courses that are happening at the university here. And we actually have an Esperanto museum at the university. And I was like, oh, okay. And then also he's like, we've got an Esperanto park. And I was like, okay, so apparently there's a park there that was named um, Esperanto Park or something and then there's also like uh, some things about Zamenhof and stuff in that park which I never actually had time to go to that park because I was literally just passing through one day in this city. So I reached out to him and then he told me to come on a certain date and when I arrived at the university I came in basically um, the Chinese version of Uber which is like Didi. So I came to the university gates um, and one thing you guys need to know about with China is if you're a uh, foreigner, so you're not Chinese, you need to use your passport to do anything, okay? You want to get a train ticket, you need your passport. You want to uh, enter a university or a museum or anything like that, you need your passport. You want to travel to a different city, you need your passport. You want to buy something that's not like just food and stuff, that's a bit more like complex and you need to install that, well guess what, you need your passport. You need to be identified at all times basically. And I know there's going to be a lot of comments about that in the, the, com the comments below, but I don't want to get into the whole politics of it. I just wanted to give you guys a holistic view of what was happening. So I rocked up at the university with my wife who was there and the guy at the university, he like checked my passport and he's like, yeah, yeah, um, we've been told to expect you. And I was like, oh, cool. And then the, the vehicle went up into the university and there's like this ring road in front of the university. And there was like a bunch of 
students, I'd say like seven students there, and they're like holding up a big Esperanto flag, waving around, waiting for my arrival, and I was like, oh, okay, I feel like kind of a celebrity type of thing, <laughs> which was kind of funny. And I popped out of the car, and I walked over to them, and of course I started speaking Esperanto. Now, the group consisted of um, basically three different levels of Esperanto speakers because they came from actually the classes that were there. So you had a bunch of beginners who whose Esperanto ability was um, basically uh, like very, very low level. You could ask them very basic things. I actually communicated with them primarily in Chinese. Then you had a couple of um, mid-level Esperanto speakers who uh, they all understood a fair bit and they were able to chat, but it was like, it was quite difficult. And then there was like one representative from the top class because apparently when I arrived, it was already the holiday period and most of them had left the university. Uh, and this one guy who was there, he was a, a young guy. He'd actually already graduated from, I think like a three year course in Esperanto. Uh, and plus like all these other things. And it was actually quite interesting to meet him because his Esperanto level was on par with mine. So I could have like a full conversation with this guy. It was, it was great. And I found out that uh, basically he's graduated from university and he's kind of considered the star of his university because what happened was that he managed to get a position in government and getting a government position in China is super high sought after because uh, the work hours are good, you get really good salary, you get really good benefits and it's really prestigious to work in the government in China and you, they literally give you like this, um, it's like, you know when you go to sports teams or like to like a, a festival and they got like the, the bandana that goes across your chest and like has some words written on it. I forget the word in English for it. Anyway, he had that basically pointing out that he was, you know, like this star of the school in a sense. Um, so it's a very different like feeling to what would happen here. Anyway, he was a very cool guy. I chatted a fair bit with him. Uh, and he, he actually <laughs> did not speak English very well at all. So when I asked him about it, he's like, yeah, my English level's like down there. Don't even try to speak to me in English, <laughs> which was kind of cool because like it's rare that you meet someone who has Esperanto at a much higher level compared to English, especially in this very modern world. Uh, so um, he took me up into the museum part where there's basically a very large building, like this massive building and it says Esperanto Museum. And unfortunately I didn't film any of it at that time, uh, primarily because YouTube was not in my mind. Like I wasn't thinking about doing YouTube. I actually had, to be honest guys, I had no intention of ever coming back to YouTube. Um, I felt like that part of my life was over and I'd moved on. Uh, <laughs> but I guess I'm back now. Um, so yeah, anyway, I didn't film any of it. I did take some photos and stuff, uh, which I will randomly pop up on the screen as this uh, story unfolds. And I met an old guy there, this old Esperanto speaker who was like, he was um, a verde de papo in a sense. Uh, so that's like, what, the translation would be like a green pope. He was like uh, idealistic about the language. And an amazing guy, very, modest and everything, spoke really, really well, but he had already retired, but he was volunteering at this university and in the classes to just try and keep the lessons going through. And what he told me is that, uh, especially in his area with Esperanto, what had happened was that um, there, there used to be a ton of support from the local government uh, for Esperanto communities because a lot of those people within the government uh, in some way had interacted with Esperanto or even spoke Esperanto but as time had passed by and as you know the whole world commercialized and stuff and English became a priority for most people those people basically retired out of government positions and the government support of Esperanto in that area in particular had weakened drastically and because he was still considered an authority figure among a lot of the people in that area um, he managed to keep the Esperanto courses running at the university and his fear was that when he truly retired that those courses would come to an end. Uh, so that was a bit of a sad part to it but he said besides that he was quite happy especially with um, that student that got into government who spoke Esperanto because he saw that as like the uh, the flame that would continue on the local thing. It was very interesting in a lot of ways. Anyway I saw inside the museum there was lots of uh, like relics from the Esperanto uh, history, books obviously, 
um, various like pins and everything you could imagine in some way, like collections of all sorts of random stuff. But the part for me that was the best was that the, uni the museum wasn't designed for foreigners, it was designed for Chinese people. So it was designed to present Esperanto to Chinese people and I had my wife with me and my mother-in-law. Now my wife knows about Esperanto, obviously, because she, she spent a very long time with me. My mother-in-law knows about it, but they, they have like a external view of Esperanto via English in a sense. And here, as she was in the museum, they had like this great big banners about famous Chinese authors and stuff who wrote in Esperanto, but also wrote in Chinese. They were famous actually in Chinese as opposed to being in Esperanto, but they had done stuff in Esperanto. And she was looking at this wall going, oh my God, these are like, some of these are my favorite authors. I did not know that they spoke Esperanto. Uh, so she that opened up so much for her because it, it became it, it, it became more of a thing that was related to her culturally in a way besides just via me. Uh, anyway, they showed me around the museum and afterwards uh, we took some photos together obviously and then I got this book which I think I showed in a previous film very quickly um, and it's like the concise history of Chinese Esperanto uh, movement and they, they were very proud about the fact that, uh, let me just show, there's a, there's a picture in here of, okay, so here it is. So this picture here says, so, uh, so, the de Zedong pri Esperanto en mil now. so the signature of Mayo Zedong, which if you know anything about Chinese history, he's like one of the most important leaders of the, the communist revolution. Um, and he wrote about Esperanto in, 1939 and they've got a translation of it in here um i just want to uh read what it says to you guys because i find these things even if you don't speak esperanto just to be fascinating okay so i'm going to read it in esperanto first and then i'm going to attempt to translate it so it says se oni prenas esperanton kiel formon por disconigi la ideon vere internaciisman kaj la ideon vere revolucian, do Esperanto povas esti lernata kaj devas esti lernata. So it says, basically, that if one can take Esperanto as a form for um, distributing a truly internationalistic, internationalistic ideal, and the idea, or a truly internationalistic revolutionary idea, then Esperanto can be learned and must be learned. So that was just a really interesting thing that he had actually heard about Esperanto in a way. I did get another book, and if you guys give me a sec, I'm gonna check if I've got it in one of my boxes here. So unfortunately I can't find the book because most of my books are still packed up from the move, but that's essentially what happened while I was over there in China. I hope that I get to go again sometime soon and explore more aspects of this because it always fascinates me how this language has wormed its way into the most random places in the world. Okay, that's it. Catch you guys next time.